inside the board and free from the hive mind, this is Rex Bear hosting Leap Project. The Leap Project was created to offer awareness and information not found in the mainstream news. With over 90% of the world's media controlled by only six enormous conglomerates, many people today are looking for more accurate information. The Leap Project offers a refreshing approach to the brain drained media. Check back daily for new content as we thrive to bring you the cutting edge in news, current events, on scene video footage, interviews, and most importantly, the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, we have special guest Dr. Courtney Brown, director of the Farsight Institute, one of the most advanced remote viewing guilds on the planet, with techniques developed by the military that have been refined and improved for over a decade. Tonight's topics is one of the most impactful moments in our nation's history, the JFK assassination. We will be discussing the Farsight Institute's findings with two of the best remote viewers, Dick Algeyer and Dad Smith. You can find more of the Farsight's works at www.farsight.org. Courtney, it's great to have you on the show with us tonight. How have you been? Hey, this is super. I'm so great to be here, Rex. And look, uh, I want to thank you for inviting me back uh, more than once. Absolutely. You know, you're, you're definitely a regular here at the Leak Project, and I, I consider you a friend, a definitely very knowledgeable, and I really appreciate what you've done with the Farsight and the different projects you put together. Uh, I watch Daz and, and Dick when they do their you know, remote viewing sessions, and those guys are awesome. I've had a chance to talk to Dick before. I'll probably have him on here again soon, and you know, great guy. I haven't had a chance to speak with Daz yet, but hopefully that'll come soon. So yeah, they're, they're both really unusual. It's such an honor not only to be here talking with you, but also to be able to work with people like Dick Algeyer and Daz Smith. I mean, it's not many scientists get a chance to work with people of that caliber. Oh, it's it's mind-boggling. It just it absolutely amazes me every time I watch these guys. I think to myself, with the abilities that these guys have, you could you could do pretty much anything. It's just it's just amazing. It, it's just it's a real interesting thing. And you know, there's a lot of people that study remote viewing, but it's like playing the piano. There's a lot of people that play the piano, but there's very few that are of the level of say Lang Lang playing in Carnegie Hall. I mean, it's and so Dak, Daz Smith and Dick Algai are at that level. So it's it's you know it's when you're trying to talk about remote viewing, which is a mental perception of transferring information across time and space, we're dealing with a 7 billion population planet where almost all of them think that's not possible. So if you're dealing with remote viewers that can sort of show target contact or some level of information, uh, that's not persuasive to a zillion skeptical people. So. You need people that are of the caliber of Des Smith and Dick Elgar to be able to show absolutely unambiguous descriptions of verifiable targets that you can just say, wow, that's amazing. So there's, there's no ambiguity about it. So it's, a, it's an important thing, not just that we're glad to be able to work with them, but they're making an important contribution to the planet. Yeah, there's there's certainly grandmasters in their field, and when I was watching the the two part series that you put together about the JFK assassinations, in the first part, when Daz is writing down what he's seen and what he's feeling, uh, he he brings up some certain terms that that I found very interesting, and I wanted to ask you about those. Sure. Now, uh, when he the first thing he says that caught my attention is he says it feels like a death situation. Yeah, he, he perceived fun. He he. They moved really quickly into the target, but they he he you know pretty soon realized that this target. Remember, for those listeners who may be a little new to this, remote viewing is a mental procedure, but it's done totally blind, meaning the remote viewers cannot be told anything about the target in order for this process to work. They have to be just given a non-leading email saying there is a target, remote view it. Then they do these procedures that are derivative of things that were originally developed by the U.S. military and used for espionage purposes. And then in, they do these procedures on paper and pen and then eventually move to a video sessions where they record their perceptions on video. And that's what we show in our project so you can actually see the remote viewing under totally blind conditions recorded live. It's extremely persuasive once you actually see it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, get back, getting back to your question. Why don't you repeat your question again? I'm sorry, I just gave a little background to it, but... No, no problem. I'm glad you did. Now, he says it feels like a death situation. Uh, he brings yeah. up transfer of energy. And I was wondering if you could discuss that with us a little bit. Well, the issue is that there is a blind target. The remote viewers don't know anything. So they have to go into it and just piece together these feelings, intuitions about what this thing is. So eventually, Des Smith figured out this is a death event. Somebody, Because he could have been given any target. He had no idea that it was the JFK assassination. 
So eventually he figured out this is a death event. I mean, somebody died in this particular target. So there are a lot of people, a number of viewers, who can perceive elements of a target. That's not that unusual. But what is unusual is the ability to pursue a target. So, you know, Rex, let me emphasize this. It's the pursuing of the target that is so unusual with Dick Allgaier and Desmith. They get something and they don't just stop there. They pursue it. That's what makes the difference between an intermediate remote viewer and, you know, a blockbuster remote viewer. The ability to pursue a target. So when they perceive something, they don't just describe this perception so that they show that they had some evidence of perceiving the target. They say, okay, I've got this, and then what is that all about? And then they keep going like a detective. They pursue it, pursue it, pursue it. That is the you know, great accomplishment of the best remote viewers. They pursue it. So he perceived that there was a death event. That was the initial perception. And then he said, okay, so somebody died. Now what the heck is going on here? And then he continues to sort things out. And you're talking about the first, the first video of the two-part documentary which is about the shooters, the people who actually shot JFK on Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas, back in 1963. And so once he figured out there was a death event, he said, well, what happened? And he traced two teams of expert marksmen that uh, had three members each, and he described what the jobs were of each person in each team and how they dispersed at the end to cover their tracks. I mean, it's fascinating. But what you're telling me is, that you notice that his initial perceptions was a death event. So when we get to the rest of it, the full story, it's because of that ability to pursue that these remote viewers tell us so much about these targets. Well, and what else was neat about it was when he said transfer of energy, and this is off the subject just a little bit, but it certainly brings a spark of hope for those that might not believe in the afterlife or not know per se what there is in the afterlife. And when he says transfer of energy, it just almost sounds like a, you know, a butterfly coming out of a cocoon or something like that when you leave this physical well, body. So, you know, um, let me just mention that there's a, a special thing here that I normally don't talk about because it normally never happens. But this video went on to two hours and 20 minutes. So it was long. And you know, that's about as much as we can fit on a DVD. Now, normally we include all of the stuff that the remote viewers get. We just put it all on there. So it's a, it's a documentary of record. So this is a remote viewing. So we don't like edit it up and chop it up and put fast-paced clips in. And normal video editing has clips that last from two to five seconds long. And that goes on for a whole two-hour movie. So we don't do that. We just let the remote viewers tell their story. But once we got to two hours and 20 minutes and there was really nothing more we could cut, there was still some stuff that was recorded that I couldn't fit in the video. And you happen to be raising, <laughs> you're the first person to do that, by the way, you're having to be raising a question of what happened to JFK after he died, the afterlife. And Daz actually did about half an hour on that very subject, meaning he followed the spirit out of the body and you know, found out what, what was his reaction and what was going on with him afterwards. <laughs> now, we, that didn't seem to us to be so, at least it didn't seem to me, I was doing the, the final cutting, to be as crucial as the basic information that we needed, which was the shooters. Who did the shooting? That was the purpose of that target, to find out what actually happened in Dealey Plaza. But I said to myself, you know, this may be something we'll put out later, which is JFK in the afterlife. After he, It was a very interesting half hour, 45 minutes of extra stuff that Daz gave us about JFK after he died. And it was a shame we couldn't fit it in the video, but honestly, two hours and 20 minutes, you just we just can't stick anymore on a, <laughs> on a, on a DVD. So we had to, uh, it would have gone over three hours and that's why we had to break the 9-11 project up into two videos that was our first time to do that we had approximately four hours of material and we were actually going to see if we could stick four hours of material on a dvd but the compression rate would have been so horrendous that it just wouldn't have looked very good so we said we have no alternative we're going to break it into two and that turned out to be almost a standard practice for us now so when we have a lot of material we break it into two separate things that have sort of a coherency to them so with 9-11, we broke the first video of the remote viewing documentary up to the World Trade Center attacks, and the second one was the Pentagon attacks and the organization of the attackers. And so when we did the JFK thing, we broke it up in terms of the shooters, 
And then the second documentary was the organizers, the people who organized the overall assassination. But that one piece that you just mentioned about JFK after he died, the spirit coming out of the body and his reaction, uh, that was clipped out. I can mention a little bit about it, by the way, if you're interested. Well, yeah, that'd be great. And was that what he meant when he said he saw ghosts? Yeah. You see, what happened was he, uh, he actually perceived, again, this is all recorded live, but it's not in the documentary. We had to cut it out. Uh, he actually perceived the spirit coming out of JFK. And there was a little initial surprise. But then there was a huge feeling of relief and happiness. And he had felt there was a sense of accomplishment. Something was done. It was a, and he was willing to walk away from the whole thing. He sort of knew this is what the planet was like. This is, he did his thing and he was willing to walk away uh, from it with a satisfied feeling. It wasn't like, oh, damn, I got shot. How could, that, how could those SOBs do that thing? This is, this is a lousy deal. None of that. It was almost a feeling of, well, thank God it's over. And this is great. And it was a real, you know, he was proud of what he did. And there was a feeling of some almost euphoria coming out of the body um, after the initial shock, of course. That's there was an initial surprise. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. And when he talked about the key target is time slowing down, what do you think he meant by that? That was really interesting. That we kept in the video. Um, he was saying it was almost like watching an old movie. And in part two, where he talked about the organizers, he was really talking like that. Like it was almost like watching a, an old movie. He was dating it past, you know, to that time period, like an old movie, black and white type thing. And he, uh, everything was happening so fast. It was like in his his own mind, he knew that everything in the physical world was happening like, wow. But in his own mind, he slowed everything down so he could actually watch the bullets fly through the air and follow them and, <laughs> and then trace them back to where they came from. Remote viewers that are really good can do that type of thing. And it was just fascinating to see him say, this is like really happening fast, but it's like watching it in slow motion. Uh, you know, it's an interesting then you have to actually see it. By the way, those people, those listeners that want to see it, I really encourage you to watch it, to learn about how remote viewing is actually done, to see it done live. It's uh, www.farsight.org, F-A-R-S-I-G-H-T, like seeingfar.org, O-R-G, because we're a nonprofit. And it's our latest documentary, a remote viewing documentary. So it's a very interesting new project. We've got new stuff coming out too, but this is the latest and latest and greatest and extremely interesting. Yeah, keep them coming. I mean, every time you bring something else out there, it's it's definitely mind-bending information, and it's good to get a perspective where it's not some type of Hollywood fluff or you know mind control media, basically. And I'm <laughs> yeah, being a little yeah. facetious there, but um, so you talk. One thing he also Daz says is he goes uh, AOL CIA, and that's when he was talking about the different yeah. the the two different sets of shooters. Yeah. What is it? What well, do you mean by that? Well, uh, AOL is a CRV or controlled remote viewing term. That means analytic overlay. And that means that the conscious mind comes in and makes a conclusion about something that it says this looks like or this feels like. So you can't actually say that as real data because raw perceptions with remote viewing have to be low level. That means they have to be saying there's an organization, these are the people, this is how it is. But it's you can't actually say something like this is the CIA because you don't really know. But you can say this feels like the CIA. Because, you know, it's remote viewing data is like, let's say you were remote viewing a basketball. Uh, the remote viewer most likely would never say, this is a basketball. No, they'd say, this is a circular global type of uh, object. It has a rubbery texture. It seems hard when you touch it. It looks like it's something that could be thrown, perhaps bounced, uh, there's compressed there's a sense of compressed atmosphere inside it. it has a little bumpy texture on the outside and it seems to be moving very quickly over an interior surface with lots of subjects moving around quickly on that surface as well <laughs> so that's how they would describe a basketball in a basketball game they wouldn't say oh wow this is uh this is uh this is a um this is a uh you know a basketball game and <laughs> this is 
they wouldn't say, you know, this is the, the Knicks, Knicks or right. something like that. They, so they Knicks describe right. it in those low-level terms. So when he came up with the idea that this is a CIA, he's not really allowed to say this is a CIA. He has to say AOL. That means it's a conclusion. It's an overlay. It's a conscious mind sort of high-level organizational label. And so he accurately puts it down as an AOL, which is an analytic overlay, not as regular data. Now, in every analytic overlay or in SRV, so scientific remote viewing, uh, in, that's a different style of remote viewing, in every analytic overlay or deduction, as it's called in uh, SRV or scientific remote viewing, there is something in it that is correct. So what we do in, in SRV, scientific remote viewing, is every time we have a deduction, or what CRV would call an analytic overlay, we ask the question. We write it down, we declare it first, like write it down and declare it as a deduction, or in CRV they'd call it AOL. But then we say, what did I perceive that made me think of that? So in the situation of an AOL of the CIA, Daz went on later to describe sort of a higher level organization at the top type of a thing, intelligence gathering type of stuff. So. You know, CIA may have been correct, may have not been correct, it doesn't matter, but it had, whatever it was, that organizational flavor had the, had the intuitive sense of that type of an organization. And what can you tell our listeners about the two different sets of shooters? Well, uh, according to these remote viewing data, now remember, remote viewing data are not yet accepted in mainstream science as being real. That doesn't mean they're not real, that just means mainstream science hasn't accepted that. So, but that's normal with mainstream science. There's a lot of things that they believe in mainstream science that are just screwy. But nonetheless, it hasn't. And also, these things would, remote viewing data would not be accepted in the court of law. But they are accepted among many people who know about remote viewing and about the phenomenon, know the reality of it. And so it is taken very seriously. And when people look at the actual sessions, then, then it becomes very persuasive that, you know, this phenomenon is real. But in terms of the actual shooters, according to these remote viewing data, and that's why I gave that preamble to it, so I have to say, according to these remote viewing data, this is a remote viewing documentary, the, the shooters were expert marksmen. There were teams of three. One guy who had, in each team of three people, there were two teams, uh, one guy had the actual rifle and did shooting. The other guy was a, an assistant, like a helper, and then there was a third guy that sort of stood back for each of the two teams and was an overseer, was, a, was sort of keeping watch over everything, making sure everything happened and was done. And then when the shooting was over, they picked up and left, and the overseer was the one who walked over to where the other two were at the end and made sure nothing was left and everything was cleaned up and that type of thing. One, of, one group of three went off together, and the other group of three split up into three separate directions. But the shooters themselves, both Dick Algeyer and Daz Smith, perceived this. They were really good. They were really, really good. They were expert marksmen. And they were using good equipment. Now, the official government story, of course, is that Lee Harvey Oswald was the sole, you know, a lone shooter, just himself, an isolated one-person one shooter. And that he shot some gun that was later found in one of the buildings in, next to, you know, along Dealey Plaza. Now, the, in the Warren Commission report, um, the governmental, the governmental uh, gun experts took that gun and inspected it, and it was broken. It was not in good condition. It could fire something, but it, it, was, in, it, was, in, it was in gunky uh, condition, number one, uh, and its telescopic scope was broken. So the government's own experts uh, in, in gun stuff tried to fix the telescopic scope with the shims, and they couldn't do it. <laughs> so it's very hard to believe that that gun could actually have been used in uh, the shooting of JFK. Now, I don't know much about guns. I'm not a big gun person. But I do know about people who like guns and who are expert marksmen. Now, not just ordinary people that like guns, but expert marksmen who like guns. And that is that they take care of their equipment really well. They polish it. They make sure it's in really good order. They make sure it shoots straight. I mean, they, yeah, you know how people that really prize their guns and are expert marksmen think about their weapons. I mean, that's a oh, yeah. big deal. They, they treat their weapons like Paul Newman used to like to treat his race cars. So Paul Newman, the famous actor, now dead, 
he was also a race car driver and he took care of his race cars like they were his own babies. I mean, he really took care of those race cars, made sure that the engines were perfect, everything was just right. Well, that's how an expert, expert marksman takes care of his guns. And that gun that the government said shot JFK would not have been the type of gun in that condition that an expert marksman would have used. It was broken. So, I mean, it could have shot a bullet, but it couldn't be aimed properly. So, whoever did shoot JFK obviously shot JFK from a very considerable distance away and shot him spot on. And so, that person was an expert marksman by any telling of it. And there's no indication that Lee Harvey Oldwald fits that description. And the gun that they say he used certainly does not fit the description of the type of weapon that could have used it. Now, we don't get into detailed analyses of physical data. I just use that as sort of a basic introduction to some of the questions that have arisen about the physical data. We present the remote viewing data. So you asked me about the, the marksman, and you have to actually see Daz's and Dick's description of these people to fully grasp it, to see how it is, that, that, how that they actually describe these people with such intricate detail. But the, the remote viewing data clearly identify these people as people who really knew how to shoot. This is not the first time they did stuff like this. They, this is what they did. They were assigned things like this, and they were really expert. And so uh, Lee Harvey Oswald just doesn't fit that description. And the gun they said he used really does not fit that description. Even in some of the remote viewing data, you have Daz and Dick talking about the guns themselves that they were actually using, taking them out of the cases, assembling them, putting them together in preparation for the shooting. I mean, it's really detailed stuff. You have to see it to believe it. Anyway, so um, you asked me about the shooters, and so what I'm saying is that what information we, we got, we got about the shooters, really does not match the official story that is out there about Lee Harvey Oswald. Did you ever ask any questions, or um, did they ever pinpoint why Lee Harvey Oswald was used as a patsy? Well, that's a bit in part two of the documentary. The basic idea is that if you're going to kill a president and you are doing it as an inside job, then you're going to have to have somebody assigned to be the guilty person, the patsy because the public is going to demand having somebody. And so if there's an inside job, part of the actual planning will have to include determining who that patsy is going to be and setting that person up very carefully. So um, the remote viewing data for part two, and again, this is remote viewing data for part two, uh, they, those data clearly describe the, the need to set up all of the different elements and then to have what they called what Dick Algari called a firewall between uh, actually a series of firewalls between the organizers the high level organizers and the people who actually did the the shooting itself so um this that would have been given that would have been the tasks of the organizers to make sure that there was somebody that was going to get the blame you can't shoot a president and then say, oh, and we don't know who did it, the person got away. I mean, that, that would not have worked for an inside job. So, you know, if these remote viewing data are correct, uh, and they, they seem to be, from my perspective, more believable than the official story. And they were all taken, they were all, these data were all gotten from totally blind, really great conditions. So, you know, really clean scientific conditions so and they corroborate each other the remote viewing data of dick and the remote viewing data of daz so perfectly match that it's very persuasive to me especially when the official story simply simply doesn't doesn't match so some of the information that you're asking about lee harvey oswald we may not know about but you can sort of piece it together given the amount of information which is a ton that we do know about right now and and also the description of the the weapons that were used and the uh, and the people did they did they track down where they came from like who actually gave them the orders? 
Well, in part two, they, we, we speculate a bit. I speculate a little bit because the, um, the pictures, the sketches of the higher, highest level person involved in the organization look very much, really, a lot like a person that was well known at the time. And so I can't say that that person actually was it because it could just be a person that looks like that person. But Dick Algeyer drew a sketch of the person that was, you know, almost a, a perfect sketch of J. Edgar Hoover. At least it looked like J. Edgar Hoover. With, and he called him the jowly guy, the jowly guy, meaning the guy who has jowls. And he had a good description of his hair and everything. And then he went and described the guy's car, which was a black Cadillac. And at one point he called it a Cadillac and he, he, he drew a picture of it. And it's a, just about a perfect match for the Cadillac. I mean, if you look at the picture of the Cadillac and you look at the sketch, Dick's sketch, you say, wow, that's the same car. That's what it looks like. And then also Dick said, um, this guy is, is getting sort of orders from higher up. He's not the top, but he's the one that's in charge of organizing the whole thing. And um, he said that the, the guy is afraid of the attorney general. Now, the attorney general at that time was Bobby Kennedy, Kennedy uh, John Kennedy's brother. So that would have been unnatural. Now, these, those perceptions do not prove at all that J. Edgar Hoover was the guy. The only thing they can say is that, it, that the person that Dick Elgar describes looks like J. Edgar Hoover. And he drives a car that looks like J. Edgar Hoover's car. And he's afraid of the attorney general. So that's, but there could be somebody else that fits into that description. There's probably a lot of jolly guys in Washington. And, you know, so we can't, it, remote feeling data cannot be used to prove anything. You know, let me, Rex, let me tell you that the best way to look at something like that, a remote feeling sketch that looks like somebody, is to think of it as similar to a police sketch. Now, a police sketch is when somebody witches something and then, they go to the police department downtown and they work with an artist and they come up with a sketch of who the guy, the perpetrator, looks like. Now, that sketch does not go to court. That sketch is not proof of anything. But what that sketch is, is it's given to the detectives and the detectives use that sketch to help them, to help direct them to looking for other physical evidence, such as eyewitness reports, testimony, uh, other physical evidence. Um, so it... it it helps the direction of the detectives, but the, the sketch itself doesn't become evidence. It's not something that you can actually say this proves anything. They look, but they use it to, to find physical stuff. So that's, that's how you should think of remote viewing data. Remote viewing data can't be used to prove anything, but for those people who know and understand how the remote viewing phenomenon works, they can be used similarly to a police sketch. So the police can say, okay, we have a lead now. It sort of looks like that guy. Drives a car like that car. Is afraid of attorney general. And so that's how it goes. So, you know, that's the best way to think of it. When you think about the JFK thing, one of the things you want to ask is, if J. Edgar Hoover or the FBI was involved, would that have made sense at all? Well, if there was an inside job that was orchestrated from higher up, then it sort of makes sense that they would have had to have in, uh, included J.F. Gregor Hoover, the FBI, in it because of the following. If they were going to, if somebody was going to assassinate the president as an inside job, then you can't not include the FBI because the FBI then would have made a full-scale investigation into who actually shot the president, and the FBI would have caught the people and handed them over to the Justice Department. So. If you're going to do something like shooting a president, you have to involve the law enforcement element itself or you're going to get caught. <laughs> so it sort of makes sense from a substantive perspective. But, you know, and who's the just, attorney that, general at that time, Courtney? J. J. Edgar Hoover. But that's just me speculating. That doesn't say that we're I'm definitely not claiming that. I'm not saying that we're just speculating based on the the uh, the, the the nature of the sketches and descriptions that especially Dick Elgar produced with regard to that guy. You know, one of the things you want to say is, what are the motives that somebody could have inside the government to having wanted to kill John F. Kennedy? So if you look at it, he was in, he was in the White House for almost three years. 
And in that three years, we had started out with the Bay of Pigs, and that was where you had a CIA-organized invasion of Cuba using uh, Cuban exiles. And the invasion was launched, and Kennedy, it was organized during the Eisenhower administration, and Kennedy at the last minute said, this is crazy, this isn't going to work. They had told him that the Cubans would, that we were very, they were very unhappy with Castro and they would rise up and throw the guy out. And Kennedy at the last moment said, that's not going to happen. So he, he pulled back the U.S. military support of the Cuban exiles that were landing at the Bay of Pigs. And the Cuban exiles were all shot or captured and it was a big fiasco internationally. So, you know, among the higher level members of the CIA, they were probably really upset with him because it was, you know, he, he stopped their invasion and it was a really disastrous and very embarrassing thing and the whole thing. In addition, Bobby Kennedy and John Kennedy were making a serious effort to, organ to go after organized crime. So organized criminals were also likely to be suspects for wanting to kill John F. Kennedy. In addition, apparently, there, John F. Kennedy made at, at least eight attempts to kill Castro. And Castro was also a suspect that could have been involved because he could have said, hey, you know, Kennedy's got to go before I go. It's either him or me. He's tried eight times. And then, and then we had the Cuban Missile Crisis where there were three days where literally the whole planet was at risk of being blown up because of the standoff between Russia, I mean, Soviet Union and the United States. And then we also had um, the big, very tense meeting between Khrushchev and Kennedy. So that was another level of, you know, is this good for that stuff? And then he had sort of uh, throwing the gauntlet down and saying, we're going to land a man on the moon before the end of the decade or else. So Kennedy was sort of involved in these major grand gestures. Now, any one of those things would have been more than enough for a single presidential term. But Kennedy had all of them in there. In addition, he was on a lot of medication, a lot of pain medication for his back. And there were some reports that he had been smoking marijuana in the, in the White House, which in those days would have been considered you know, very frowned upon. And apparently he had a significant number of extramarital affairs, some in the White House. So, you know, among conservative military law enforcement types, intelligence types, in the United States, they could have looked at that whole combination of stuff and said, this guy is not good. And they could have said, we need to get rid of him. He's phenomenally popular. There's no way he's going to lose the election. So for the betterment of the nation, uh, we have to get rid of him. Now, I am not arguing that at all. I think it was a disaster, a horrible thing that had happened. But I can see how some people in the intelligence community and um, other elements within the U.S. government could have actually wanted it to happen. And so it sort of makes sense to me that, that it might have happened because they could have said, look, so much has happened in, in less than three years. What if this goes on for another, uh, another five? He wins elections and he wins the re-election and, you know, are we going to survive? So they could have been thinking along those lines and they also could have been thinking in terms of just a grudge because you know he was there apparently he was thinking of dismantling or restructuring the CIA itself so it wasn't just a bay of pigs party that was ruined by John F Kennedy but you know the the organization itself might have been considered considered under threat by this president so you know th there were a lot of potential motivations in that however it happened what these remote viewing data clearly portray is a picture where somehow in the governmental apparatus of the United States, the decision was made to kill him. And they organized this at the very highest levels and set it up with all types of firewalls to prevent people from tracing it back to them. But you know, that was in the days before remote viewing. Now we're in a situation where we can go back and watch the whole thing all over again. And it's the end of secrecy, actually. And when you say at the very top levels, did you happen to get any information on other people that might have looked 
similar to you know certain individuals that were within the you know just as an example the CIA. There's a lot of speculation that uh, Bush Senior might have been involved and other factions. So, and you brought up some of them like the you know the organized crime, the mob, etc. Did you find any other information on other people as well that could have been possibly hypothetically speaking involved? No. However, I do know that there are many people watching the documentary that are looking at a lot of the sketches and making comments about thinking that this could have been that person, this could have been the other person, and so on. But we really don't have any way to know that. For So even with the J. Edgar Hoover thing, the only reason I mentioned J. Edgar Hoover is because the sketch that was produced was so close. It was It was such a very clear sketch that looked like a picture of J. Edgar Hoover that people were going to make the connection anyway and especially the sketch of his car looks so much like his car and the fact that he was afraid of the attorney general was another so I brought it up to sort of tell people that you cannot say that these remote viewing data prove anything the sketch may look like Jade Edgar Hoover over his the sketch of his car may look exactly like his car and it is sort of odd that the guy is afraid of the attorney general but you know as incriminating as that looks, it, you really can't say that this proves anything. All you can say that there is somebody that looks like that, drives a car like that, and is afraid of the Attorney General. You have to get physical evidence to sort of back this up. But it does give you a lead. It does give you more information than you had before. But the, I must admit, even, even me, the, the clarity of those sketches really took me back. It really set me back. It was like, whoa, this is amazing. <laughs> it looks... So even I was sort of amazed by that. But in terms of other people, I didn't even go, I didn't even go there. I was <clears throat> more concerned about heading off any discussion saying that these remote viewing data prove anything. So I wanted to make sure that did not that did not happen. You know, it's a little bit like the movie Magnum Force with Clint Eastwood. At the very end of the movie, a corrupt cop thinks he's you know beaten Clint Eastwood, and he doesn't know that Clint Eastwood had switched the bomb from one spot to the next spot, and the corrupt cop was laughing at Clint Eastwood and driving off in the car, and the car blows up. And the camera shoot, you know, cuts back to Clint Eastwood, close up of his face, and Clint Eastwood says the line, a man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> so with remote viewing, it's like that. A man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> Some things we cannot say. I bet simply because we really can't say it. We don't know. Right. And also, it was very odd how, you know, uh, was it Ruby killed Lee Harvey Oswald as, as open as he did. Were there any, uh, did, were they able to go to that moment in time? No. And no, no they, there was no remote viewing component that went to the death of Lee Harvey Oswald. In fact, Lee Harvey Oswald didn't even show up in these data, although Dick Algayer in, in the part two, documentary did speculate that one of the people he saw he did think was Lee Harvey Oswald or might have been Lee Harvey Oswald and he actually has those that a commentary section about that but it was not that Lee Harvey Oswald was a shooter but that he was set up as a patsy type of a thing uh, but that you know that was that was in the in the second part of the documentary but that was Lee, that was Dick Algayer sort of looking at his data afterwards and making a comment about this is what he sort of thinks about it and you know, the remote viewers are uncomfortable about analyzing their own data. So they're uncomfortable about doing things like that. But we like to try new things. And so in this particular case, we said, let's just try letting the remote viewers make some comments about their own data afterwards. And so we included that. And so Dick made some comments. And do you think that they've actually improved over the course of the multiple projects that you've done with them, have they even gotten better? Oh, yeah. I mean, in the beginning, everybody was doing paper and pen sessions, which were dreadfully boring to watch. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't even watch it. I mean, people writing on pieces of paper. So we were just collecting pieces of paper, scanning them in, and showing them on the website and saying, look at these sketches. It looks like this is evidence of target contact. And that was just plain boring. And so when we made the decision to try doing things standing up, um, and drawing them on a drawing surface live uh, and engaging with the camera, that was a big deal to actually make that transition to live video. Um, I mean, it's, we're not the first to do that, but 
by any means. But uh, it was great to have that transition to a, to the point where it became a major part of our, um, you know, um, sort of presentational process. Sure. And what can and, you and I must say that we're continuing with experimentation. We actually uh, um, drawing drawing remote viewing data. I actually don't think is a good idea at all, but it's something that's been done. Um, when doing it live on video, for example, is it, it has been done. But I actually think the better way to do it is not to draw at all, but to draw the to to make drawings and and collect all of your data beforehand, and then to reenact and continue the session in front of a green screen, and then to use graphics to fill in the background so it looks so you can make it look like the remote viewer is almost a ghost and you're actually watching the actual scene so that the audience can actually watch pictures of the actual targets with the remote viewers like a ghost like image moving around in it looking at things it's more complicated from a video perspective from a videography perspective but i actually think that's much better than watching people draw no matter what kind of drawing surface they use be it a paper and pen or a blackboard or dry erase board or the sand, you know, drawing lines in the sand, it doesn't really matter. Drawing is just not as interesting to watch as um, sort of a, a, a live uh, reenactment in front of a green screen. However, Dick Algeyer and Daz Smith have perfected interacting with the camera while drawing. So even though we're experimenting with other approaches, the idea of drawing and interacting with the camera takes a lot of practice skill. You have to work at it. And they've tr been working at it for a long while, and they've become really good at it. So one of the things that's happened is we have not seen any comments. I've not seen a single comment ever with all of our projects saying it was boring, meaning the people, the audiences apparently have been riveted looking at the screen, watching these viewers describe these targets. Yeah, and also, you know, what what could you share with us here at the Leak Project, Courtney? That would be, you know, something that ninety nine point nine nine percent of the uh, the population hasn't heard yet or or been informed on yet with the uh, with the viewing sessions that you guys have done on the JFK assassination. Well, you know, if you look at some of the physical investigations that have been done by people like Jim Mars. They actually spent years collecting all types of physical data that point to the idea of an inside job. And these remote viewing data are different because they're eyewitness reports, in a sense, people going back in time and watching it all over again. So if you want to see something unique, what you're saying, what you're, what you're actually seeing in terms of the whole situation is you're not going back and, and looking at physical forensic data physical forensic evidence. Now what Jim Mars has done over years collecting all that data is a, an enormous amount of work, all done in a very interesting way. But it's not a brand new eyewitness report. It's a forensic, like a detective investigation, going back and piecing together evidence. So if you want to say what is new, it's the idea of having a new eyewitness report. And I must admit that the eyewitness reports brought back with remote viewing processes uh, with Dick Elgayer and Daz Smith do seem to match a lot of the physical evidence that Jim Mars talks about. So it's a good level of corroboration between them. And so, you know, your, your question says, what can I bring back that, you know, most people have not seen yet? It's not any one piece of information. It's the general idea that you get the whole thing told from a new eyewitness account using remote viewing data. It's the whole package that's never been done before, never been seen before. And it's certainly fascinating too when we were talking at the uh, beginning of the interview, Courtney, about the transfer of energy after uh, you know Daz saw uh, John F. Kennedy get shot. He saw his you know consciousness, his spirit essence essentially leave. And I liked how you brought up the the feelings and emotions that um, that he had at that time. That's that's quite fascinating. And hopefully, maybe you can bring out uh, you know another part three clip or something like that. And also, maybe that would be uh, something that you guys might want to do in the future, possibly different types of uh, you know sessions on transference of, of consciousness, and and see if you could maybe 
follow it to the other side, you know, or, you know. And Actually, it. that's a very interesting idea, and we have tried that in some other projects, but uh, this is the one that did capture it, and we didn't include it in the in this particular project. But that that would be a good idea to actually have a project on that type of thing. However, it looks like we're going to be switching gears in 2016 to move. We've been doing a series of mystery projects. Atlantis, Giza, the origin of the Great Pyramid of Giza, 9-11, three UFO alien type targets. Now it's a JFK target. And we have one more. But we did that series, a string, in order to demonstrate to people the types of things that remote viewing could investigate when it's done at the best of conditions. But in addition to that, we also want to get into some science projects that are not mysteries projects, not, revol not resolving you know, a you know, historical mysteries. We'd like to get into some projects where the, the main issue is one of the nature of time and physical reality. It's really sort of science-oriented. We did that uh, for a long while in the past, especially with our multiple universes project that lasted for a whole year. And we did 11 times uh, doing targets that were predicting the future a month into the future, and it worked 11 times. It was really a, a great project. And so we'd like to get back into that now that we've sort of mastered how to do this on video. So anyway, the other thing is that you can look at our Young Masters section in the uh, instruction area of the navigation bar of our website, www.farsight.org. -E and in the Young Masters section, you'll see a whole bunch of different ways for experimenting with the presenting of remote viewing data and making it theatrically interesting uh, with these trainees, these new people that we're working with. So, you know, it's, uh, it's you can actually sort of see our, our thinking about how that's, that's going to be going. And we want to take some of these young people, these trainees, and start involving them in projects. And a good set of projects for them, of course, would be some science projects to get them moving in that direction. Now, I know we've only got a few minutes left here, Courtney. So, is there... Anything you'd like to share with our listeners here before you um, before we close out for tonight? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're a nonprofit. We don't have any means of advertising. So there's two things that I'd like all of your listeners to do. If you have a chance, just go to our website, farsight.org, F-A-R-S-I-G-H-T, like seeingfar.org, and first sign up for our free newsletter. It's free. We send it out approximately once a week, and it tells people what we've been doing. And we've not included any advertising on it. So it's, it's really just about Farsight stuff. And it's a newsletter. So it's a news show. It's, it, it tells the news about, this, uh, you know, about stuff that we're doing and remote viewing projects and so on. But it is news, stuff that's not covered in the major news media, but it's covered in our news. So I, sign up for that free newsletter. Just put your email address in. And we don't give the email addresses out to anybody, so there's no risk of spam. And so the second thing is to sign up to our YouTube channels. We have two YouTube channels. One is a serious science-oriented YouTube channel, and the other is for artistic works related to remote viewing. And so I would encourage people to sign up for those YouTube channels as well so you can get an idea of the stuff we're publishing. But the most important is if you can sign up for the email newsletter to keep up with what we're doing because we don't have any way of advertising. You know, like you have the latest movies coming out, and when movies come out, you see advertisements all over the place to tell you that, you yeah, know, the movie is going to be starting on this day or to that day. Well, we don't have anything like that. So, you know, signing up for the newsletter is the only way we really have to tell people what's the latest. And so that's what I'd really like to encourage people to do. Great. Yeah, appreciate that. We'll definitely make sure to do that and keep us posted on your, your newest works that you have. And I'll make sure to um, send any links I can on our channel here at The Leak Project as well for you. So... I appreciate it, and I want to thank you again so much for inviting me back on. I've been on your show a number of times, and you're a really great host. And I want to, I really want to tell you that I, I appreciate that when I get a sensitive host that asks intelligent questions and keeps things moving nicely. Well, I appreciate that, and keep up the good work. Uh, next time you have an opportunity to speak with uh, Dick or Daz, uh, you know, just let them know that I think they're doing a great job, and uh, appreciate everything, Courtney. Thank you. I will. Thank you. Okay. Take care. A very special thank you to our guest tonight. For all of you that had the opportunity to be here with us, if you enjoyed the show, follow us on YouTube, youtube.com slash clandestinetimelord, for the most recent interviews, videos, and podcasts. Or 
you can check us out on the World Wide Web, www.theproject.com. Would you like to be a guest on our show? Do you have information that the world needs to see and hear? Send us an email, guestbookings at leakproject.com. Thank you, everybody. This is Rex Bear with Leak Project. Stay safe and be the change you want to see. Good night. <laughs>from the hive mind this is rex bear hosting leak project the leak project was created to offer awareness and information not found in the mainstream news with over 90 percent of the world's media controlled by only six enormous conglomerates many people today are looking for more accurate information the leak project offers a refreshing approach to the brain drain media check back daily for new content as we thrive to bring you the cutting edge in news current events on-scene video footage interviews and most importantly the truth Ladies and gentlemen, we have special guest Dr. Courtney Brown, director of the Farsight Institute, one of the most advanced remote viewing guilds on the planet, with techniques developed by the military that have been refined and improved for over a decade. Tonight's topics is one of the most impactful moments in our nation's history, the JFK assassination. We will be discussing the Farsight Institute's findings with two of the best remote viewers, Dick Algeyer and Dad Smith. You can find more of the Farsight's works at www.farsight.org. Courtney, it's great to have you on the show with us tonight. How have you been? Hey, this is super. I'm so great to be here, Rex. And look, uh, I want to thank you for inviting me back uh, more than once. Absolutely. You know, you're, you're definitely a regular here at the Leak Project. And I, I consider you a friend, a definitely very knowledgeable. And I really appreciate what you've done with the Farsight and the different projects you put together. Uh, I watch Daz and, and Dick when they do their you know, remote viewing sessions, and those guys are awesome. I've had a chance to talk to Dick before. I'll probably have him on here again soon. And you know, great guy. I haven't had a chance to speak with Daz yet, but hopefully that'll come soon. So yeah, they're, they're both really unusual. It's such an honor not only to be here with, talking with you, but also to be able to work with people like Dick Algeyer and Daz Smith. I mean, it's not many scientists get a chance to work with people of that caliber. Oh, it's, it's mind-boggling. It just it absolutely amazes me every time I watch these guys. I think to myself, with the abilities that these guys have, you could, you could do pretty much anything. I mean, it's, just, it's just amazing. It, it's, just it's a real interesting thing. And, you know, there's a lot of people that study remote viewing, but it's like playing the piano. There's a lot of people that play the piano, but there's very few that are of the level of, say, Lang Lang playing in Carnegie Hall. I mean, it's – and so Dak, Daz Smith and Dick Algeyer are at that level. So it's – it's, you know, it's – when you're trying to talk about remote viewing, which is a mental perception of transferring information across time and space, we're dealing with a 7 billion population planet where almost all of them think that's not possible. So if you're dealing with remote viewers that can sort of show target contact or some level of information, uh, that's not persuasive to a zillion skeptical people. So. You need people that are of the caliber of Dez Smith and Dick Algar to be able to show absolutely unambiguous descriptions of verifiable targets that you can just say, wow, that's amazing. So there's, there's no ambiguity about it. So it's, a, it's an important thing, not just that we're glad to be able to work with them, but they're making an important contribution to the planet. Yeah, there's, there's certainly grandmasters in their field, and when I was watching the, the two-part series that you put together about the JFK assassinations, in the first part, when Daz is writing down what he's seen and what he's feeling, uh, he, he brings up some certain terms that, that I found very interesting, and I wanted to ask you about those. Sure. Now, uh, when he, 
the first thing he says that caught my attention is he says it feels like a death situation. Yeah, he, he perceived fun. He he. They moved really quickly into the target, but they he he you know pretty soon realized that this target. Remember, for those listeners who may be a little new to this, remote viewing is a mental procedure, but is done totally blind, meaning. The remote viewers cannot be told anything about the target in order for this process to work. They have to be just given a non-leading email saying there is a target, remote view it. Then they do these procedures that are derivative of things that were originally developed by the U.S. military and used for espionage purposes. And then they do these procedures on paper and pen and then eventually move to video sessions where they record their perceptions on video. And that's what we show in our project so you can actually see the remote viewing under totally blind conditions recorded live. It's extremely persuasive once you actually see it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, get back, getting back to your question, why don't you repeat your question again? I'm sorry, I just gave a little background to it. But no, no problem. I'm glad you did. Now he says it feels like a death situation. Uh, he brings yeah. up transfer of energy, and I was wondering if you could discuss that with us a little bit. Well, the issue is that there is a blind target. The remote viewers don't know anything, so they have to go into it and just piece together these feelings, intuitions about what this thing is. So eventually, Des Smith figured out, this is a death event. Somebody, because he could have been given any target. He had no idea that it was the JFK assassination. So eventually, he figured out, this is a death event. I mean, somebody died in this particular target. So there are a lot of people, a number of viewers, who can perceive elements of a target. That's not that unusual. But what is unusual is the ability to pursue a target. So, you know, Rex, let me emphasize this. It's the pursuing of the target that is so unusual with Dick Allgaier and Desmith. They get something, and they don't just stop there. They pursue it. That's what makes the difference between an intermediate remote viewer and you know, a blockbuster remote viewer, the ability to pursue a target. So when they perceive something, they don't just describe this perception so that they show that they had some evidence of perceiving the target. They say, okay, I've got this, and then what is that all about? And then they keep going like a detective. They pursue it, pursue it, pursue it. That is the you know, great accomplishment of the best remote viewers. They pursue it. So he perceived that there was a death event. That was the initial perception. And then he said, okay, so somebody died. Now what the heck is going on here? And then he continues to sort things out. And you're talking about the first, the first video of the two-part documentary which is about the shooters, the people who actually shot JFK on Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas, back in 1963. And so once he figured out there was a death event, he said, well, what happened? And he traced two teams of expert marksmen that uh, had three members each, and he described what the jobs were of each person in each team and how they dispersed at the end to cover their tracks. I mean, it's fascinating. But what you're telling me is, that you notice that his initial perceptions was a death event. So when we get to the rest of it, the full story, it's because of that ability to pursue that these remote viewers tell us so much about these targets. Well, and what else was neat about it was when he said transfer of energy, and this is off the subject just a little bit, but it certainly brings a spark of hope for those that might not believe in the afterlife or not know per se what there is in the afterlife.